We're, um, if you've not been with us, we're traveling with Paul on his second missionary journey. Um, it's going to take him about three years. He's going to cover about 2,800 miles and make 21 different stops planting churches in each of the spaces or most of the spaces that he, that he stops. And last week, we were focused on his time in Philippi, uh, where he shared the good news of Jesus's life, death, and resurrection. It resulted in conversions and the formation of a new community of faith. But towards the end of his time there, he and Silas were arrested, beaten, and thrown in jail uh, in the place of their darkest and most trying and painful experiences. Uh, an earthquake occurred, and it not only produced their freedom, it broke their chains, but so too it ushered in mm. the jailer and his family a new place of freedom and life. We talked about uh, what it would look like for us to be at our best when things are at their worst, because the behavior that Paul and Silas exhibited while they were in prison after being tortured uh, and without any trial being in prison, we talked about how unusual it is to sing praise in that space. It is very counterintuitive. It's not something when you or I are psychologically or emotionally or physically feeling beaten. It's not something that we normally turn to, but in their case, it responded in their freedom. And um, so that's where we left them last week was in Philippi. Today, we're going to turn from chapter 16 to chapter 17. We're going to move from Philippi, 95 miles to the west on foot to Thessalonica. Now, I want you to just think about after you had been beaten within an inch of your life, Paul actually was dragged outside the city. They thought he was dead. So certainly a concussion at the least, broken ribs, uh, just lacerated back. He's in a very uh, vulnerable and weakened state. And yet he travels 95 miles on foot to the west to a place called Thessalonica. Thessalonica is the capital of the Roman province of Macedonia. And when they arrive there, um, it would be easy for them to just kind of zone out, you know, just, just kind of hunker down for a few days, gather themselves, and just come to some new place where maybe resilience and resurrection kicked in for them. But it seems like, as the story tells us, that as they get to Thessalonica, um, they don't do that. They don't zone out. They don't numb out. They maintain a focus, and they, they go to where they normally go when they enter a town. Um, they begin in the synagogue, and as they begin teaching, they stay there for a period of at least three weeks, um, and in the midst of their pain, they are sharing their good news with others and ultimately plant a church there, a community of faithful people. Um, but as was the case in Antioch, Pisidia, Iconium, and Lystra, some of the Jews from the synagogues, after a while, become jealous of the crowds that are gathering. They become jealous um, of the teachings that are converting people to a new way, a different way than what they know to be true. And so, much like they did in those other towns, a, a group of the leaders from the synagogues form a mob and they drive them out of town. Uh, they start a riot and they push them out and they head to a small town about 50 miles southwest called Berea. And initially things go well there for them until those Jews from Thessalonica hear that things are going well and like they've done in previous towns, they travel and they chase them out of Berea. Now, an interesting thing that happens here in Berea, um, there are at least four people on this trip with Paul, or including himself. There's Paul, there's Silas, there's Luke, who's writing this account, and then there's Timothy. Well, one thing that happens on this particular uh, experience in Acts 17 is when they're driven out, when the people from Thessalonica come to persecute them, as they had in previous cities, um, Silas and Timothy stay in Berea, but Paul leaves and goes 300 miles south to Athens. Now, I just want you to consider why that might have occurred. 
Like, why didn't they all go together? Why did they split up? And the scriptures don't really tell us, but one would logically deduce that Paul was the mouthpiece. He was the one who was the primary speaker, and he was the one that they were really wanting to get at. So feeling like he would be incredibly unsafe, they ushered him out of the city, and he went south 300 miles, hoping for a little space and distance. The others stayed there and would eventually join him in a couple of weeks. But when Paul arrives finally, and I don't know how long it takes 300 miles on foot, but I would imagine, especially having been beaten within an inch of my life, because it was just less than a month that he was in a prison with having taken that beaten, that he now finds himself on the road to Athens. Now, when he arrives in Athens, he begins to walk the city streets. And one of the things that he is struck by as he does so is that Athens is full of temples and idols and altars. In fact, one of the Greek writers, Plutarch, said at that stage in time in Athens during the time of Paul, that there were more than 20,000 different statues of gods. There were more idols in Athens than there were in all of the rest of Greece combined. There were more idols in Athens than people. Now, no doubt as he walks through the city, he would have seen the Acropolis, which is kind of the city on top of the city. It rose 512 feet high, and it was a place for defense that they would use for any potential enemies that would come in. But it was also a place for worship. It was a center for worship. And on top of the Acropolis were three um, temples that were built to Athena. One of those, the most famous we know, is the Parthenon. Now, in the Parthenon, and the Parthenon, by the way, just to give you a sense for its elaborate nature, it took 10 years to basically build the bones of the structure. 10 years. And then it took them 15 more years to develop with elaborate gold inlays the beauty within the structure of the temple. So it took, in essence, 25 years to build this particular temple to Athena. But there were three of them on top of the Acropolis. And inside of the Parthenon, he would have seen a statue to Athena. The statue would have been 40 feet tall, 40 feet tall, made of gold and marble. It would have been brilliant. It, it would have been stunning. It would have been something that he wasn't used to seeing. And so as he travels through Athens and he begins to look around and see what he sees and experience sort of Athens at that time, he began to be deeply troubled. He began to, in his heart, be grieved at what he saw. But instead of getting all judgy with the people who live there and disengaging from them and going back to his hotel room and checking out and watching ESPN until his buddies arrived, he decided that he would engage the people in Athens in a way that would lead them to life. He was so concerned, he was deeply troubled, but he didn't turn his back. He didn't disengage, he engaged. He showed compassion and he moved towards them. Now he starts in the synagogue and he teaches there, but shortly after he teaches in the synagogue, he goes to the marketplace. And while he's in the marketplace, he gets in a debate with, with scholars from two different schools of philosophy. One was the Epicureans, and the other were the Stoics. And as he debates them, they think he's crazy. They think that the stuff that he's teaching sounds insane to them because he's teaching them about the resurrection. He's teaching them about Jesus without ever even mentioning Jesus. But when it comes to this issue of the resurrection, it's just mind-boggling to them. Well, anyway, they get to the place where they're hearing stuff that they've never heard, and these philosophers invite him to a place called the Areopagus, which is kind of a stone. They invite him to uh, the Areopagus, otherwise known as Mars Hill, to explain what he's been trying to teach them to the council, the high holy council of the city. There are some movers and shakers in this group. So he's going to be talking to the most famous, the most powerful, the most influential people. 
starts in the synagogue, goes to the marketplace, then goes to the Oropagus, where he has this conversation. Now, earlier, Rick read to you this section where he's conversing with, with the council, but I want to walk back through it and just make some application that I think is important for you and I as we think about our life and our faith and how it is that we actually communicate that to a larger culture around us. So in verse 22, it says, standing before the council, Paul addressed them as follows. He says, men of Athens, I noticed that you are very religious in every way. For as I was walking about, I saw your many shrines and one of your altars had this inscription to an unknown God. This God whom you worship without knowing is the one that I've come to tell you about. So when he's standing in front of the council, and he's troubled by all of the idols that he sees, he doesn't lecture them about how far off the mark they are. He doesn't talk to them about their poor value system. He doesn't talk to them about the futility of worshiping false idols. He's not angry with them. He doesn't judge them. He does what? He compliments them. He says to them, he says, fellow men of Athens, I see you guys are pretty religious. Like I've been walking around Athens for the last couple of days and I've noticed that like you actually are all in. Your worship matters to you. And he probably reeled off to them. I saw statues. I, I saw the Parthenon. I saw the big statue of Athena. I saw statues to Artemis. I saw statues to Zeus, so on and so forth. He said, but in particular, one stood out to me. He said, you have this statue with an inscription to an unknown God. He said, funny enough, that's the God I came to tell you about. It's really amazing that as he winds through the city and he looks at all their gods, he, he's looking for a place where he can engage them. And he finds one. And he says, if you don't mind, I'd love to tell you a little bit more about this God that you're worshiping that you don't even know. So he doesn't judge them. He comes to them in humility. He compliments them. And he connects with them on a level that they could understand. And then he says this about the unknown God. He said, he is the God who made the world and everything in it. And since he is Lord of heaven and earth, he doesn't live in man-made temples and human hands can't serve his needs for he has no needs. Now he says this a stone's throw away from this great goddess Athena that they've instructed, where they have constructed a 40-foot statue of. He's like, you think that this is brilliant, this statue and this temple that took you 25 years to build. He said, the God that you're worshiping that you don't even know, he's far bigger than that. He said, the gods you're serving are way too small. That would have been mind-blowing to them because they have spent years on constructing these monuments and edifices and idols. So he said, the God that I tell you doesn't tell you about doesn't live in man-made temples. Human hands can't serve his needs, for he has none. He himself gives life and breath to everything. He satisfies every need. From one man, he created all the nations throughout the whole earth. He decided beforehand when they should rise and fall, and he determined their boundaries. His purpose was for the nations to seek after God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him, though he is not very far from us. Now, you will notice as he is trying to make a case, where he is trying to make connection with them, he doesn't use any reference to the Old Testament scriptures. He doesn't use anything from the Torah. He uses nothing from the prophets. There is nothing that he uses from the scriptures. Why? Because they don't know the scriptures. They don't value them. The scriptures have no authority in their life. So why would you try to use the scriptures with authority to somebody who doesn't value them at all? You wouldn't. Their entire worldview, their value system was different from his. They were worshiping Poseidon and Venus and Zeus and Athena and Artemis. That was their background. They didn't have Moses and Joshua. They didn't have the prophets of old. They didn't have Jeremiah and Isaiah speaking into their lives. They had a very different worldview. And so what he's doing is he's looking for common ground. And he begins with a creator, a maker of the heavens and earth, one who gives life and breath to everything. 
He looks around. He says, take it all in. Look and see everything around you. The God who did all of this, you can't reduce down into an object that you can manage. He doesn't live in man-made temples. Now, as he's, as he's saying this, it's very clear to them what he's trying to get at, because this statue of Athena and this temple uh, on top of this 512-foot outcropping, the Parthenon, this magnificent temple, is something that he's just saying to them, this is nothing in comparison to this unknown God I'm here to tell you about. Your gods are too small. Don't reduce this God into something you can make or shape by your own hands. This God is glorious. He's transcendent. And serving and worshiping him is his own reward. He is not to be sought as a means to anything else. Because you see, for them, worshiping their Greek and Roman gods were always a means to some other end. Whenever you would go to the temple and you would bring an offering, you would do so in the hopes that if you were worshiping or sacrificing to Athena, you would gain wisdom. If you were worshiping or sacrificing to Artemis, that you would gain prosperity. If you were worshiping or sacrificing to Nike, that you would gain victory over your enemies. All of their gods, when they went to worship and worship them, were meant to, they were kind of like a middleman. They were a means to a better end. Now, it sounds outrageous when you think about their worship and their sacrifices and all of the hoops that they jumped through to achieve favor or comfort or security or blessing. It sounds outrageous until we consider what he might find if he actually walked through the streets of New York City today or Philadelphia today or Washington, D.C. today. Do you think Paul would see any shrines or monuments or statues to gods and goddesses that we've created? Any financial or prosperity gods? Any political gods or warrior gods? We've just come through an election season where people were flying flags and planting signs in their yards all over the place. I wonder if I wonder if Paul took a trip to Giant Stadium today around one o'clock. I don't even know whether there are fans allowed, but I wonder what he would see today at one o'clock as that game was going on. We think when we look back in time at history, this must have been crazy, all these gods they have. But I wonder what he would see if he walked through our town. I wonder what he would see that we are giving our allegiance to, where we are seeking comfort, where we are trying to find prosperity and blessing and peace. Paul says, the God that you are seeking, that you don't even know who it is, he's not a means to a better end. He is the end. And he's much closer than you know. Sometimes when you go and worship these gods, they seem so far away. They see so distant. They seem so removed. It's actually closer than you think. And then he goes on and says, for in him, we live and move and exist. As some of your poets have said, we are his offspring. And since this is true, we shouldn't think of God as an idol designed by craftsmen for gold or silver or stone. How is it that he's quoting to them their own poets? He is con connecting with them on a level that they understood. How is he so well-versed in their culture? This, this guy has come off of the beating of a lifetime. He's left within inches of his life. He's traveled 300 miles. He's now roaming their city and paying attention to their culture and looking at and listening so that in this moment with the movers and shakers of the town, he can speak to them in a language that they understand. He says, you're asking the right questions. They're just a little bit off. And this is what we need to be able to do. I think Paul teaches us here that we should be people who are deeply aware of what is going on in our culture around us, able to dialogue with without becoming untainted by it. We have to get to know our culture, to pay attention without becoming so judgmental about where we think the culture is headed. People in their own ways are crying out for God. They're looking for identity, all of us are looking for identity. 
All of us are looking for comfort. All of us are looking for security, happiness, blessing, well-being, even if sometimes we're looking in the wrong places. But you see, when you love somebody and your heart breaks for their well-being, you do whatever it takes to communicate in a way that they will understand. He's not disconnecting from a people that he's angry with. He's engaging a people that he cares about, even if their value system is different than his. And then he says to them, God overlooked people's ignorance about the things that I'm telling you in earlier times. But now he commands that everyone everywhere repent of their sins and turn to him. For he has set a day for judging the world with justice by the man he has appointed. And he proved to everyone who this is by raising him from the dead. He doesn't even mention Jesus' name. It's almost like he sets them up for another opportunity when he will come back and finish the story. It's like one of those TV shows that leaves you with a cliffhanger. He's like explaining, he's leading you to a certain point, and he says, and now is the time for repentance for you. What is repentance? Repentance is where you come to this place in your life where you, you realize, I've just, I've been heading in the wrong direction. I'm just heading someplace that has resulted in a dead end. And now I'm in this space where the right best thing to do is to turn around, to go in a different direction, to think differently. He said, this God is calling you to think differently. He said, you're sincere. You are sincerely building these places of worship and seeking these gods for these things that you so desire. But it's this one God that you're worshiping to that you don't even know who can provide you for all of that and more. So he said, repent. The only way you're going to find him is if you start moving towards him and not away from him. And then he leaves that that sort of final piece where he says, for he has set a day where he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. It's the one that you don't yet understand, but it's the one who overcame death. It's the one who experienced new life and is offering it to you today. So I'm inviting you, think differently, act differently, receive this gift. And so as he invites them to do that, the very end of the story says, when they hear him, heard him speak about the resurrection of the dead, some of them laughed in contempt. They just said, this guy's nuts. This stuff he's peddling is a joke. I've wasted my time listening to him. They just laughed him and they mocked him. And then it says, but others said, you know what? It sounds a little bit crazy, but I want to hear a little bit more. I haven't yet heard enough. I'd like to invite you back so that you can continue to tell us more because I'm on the fence. I don't yet know if what you're saying is true. And that ended Paul's discussions with them. But then it says, some joined him and actually became believers. And among them were Dionysus, a member, and that's the name of one of their gods. But he was a member of the council, that council on the Areopagus. He was a person of influence. He was a mover and a shaker. He was someone who was eventually going to make a big difference with that good news that he had received. And then also a woman named Damaris and others with them. See, I think when we care enough about the larger culture around us, we take the time to speak to it in a language that they understand. We don't judge people because they are looking for the exact same things that we are in places that are dead ends. We sympathize and we empathize and we show compassion towards people because that's what the love of God does. Paul was troubled and it led him to engage, not disengage. It led him to compliment and to bless and to enlighten. It didn't lead him to judge and condemn. It didn't lead him into a place where from a high holy hill he looked down on others as somehow lesser or not as good as he was. He cares about their life and he engages them in a way that I think is instructive for you and I. There's only one judge and that is not us. 
in all of the places where we would be so short-sighted to make judgments about other people, I think Paul would say, get to know people better. Learn to speak their language. Care about them enough to learn what it is that's important to them and why. And then speak into that from a place of empathy and compassion. And at the end of the day, some will reject you. They will think what you are sharing with them is nonsense. Others will be curious and want to know more, and yet others will respond and receive what you have. But it's not really about you. You are bearing and bringing this good news message for the sake of others. So do it well that redemption may occur and lives might be changed. I think as we close, one of the things that I would want to say to you guys is I think that of great importance as we move through what are, is a very difficult, is and has been a very difficult season in our lives. We're moving through this COVID season where it has impacted us greatly, our physical health, our economic health. Uh, much of it has been politicized. We've gone through a very um, bitter election season um, that some people still are not letting go of. We've gone through places where social injustice has occurred and violence has followed that. We've gone through a really hard time and we've never been more divided as a, as a country, as a people. And it has impacted our church greatly, not only our church, but the church. And if we're not careful about which God that we're worshiping, we're going to only deepen that division. I want you to think very closely about where you are seeking your comfort these days, about where you're seeking your security, about where you're seeking your blessing, about where you're seeking your victory, about where you're seeking your leadership. Because well-intentioned as you or I might be, sometimes we miss the mark like the people of Athens. And we start searching for those things in wrong places. And it leads us into darkness. When we were sharing communion earlier in the first service, I said to them, what leads to disintegration in our lives is when we have one set of belief in our heads, but we live differently. We live disconnected from those beliefs. And I just want us to be mindful as we navigate these hard spaces I want us to be mindful that our theology be in touch with our humanity because our life and our witness matters deeply to the people around us. And if we are being bitter and hateful and hurtful towards people who look at things differently, who believe differently, who vote differently, who have different lives and different value systems, then of what good purpose can we be in the gospel going forward to redeem this fallen and broken place? All of us are searching for something. And if you have found that which brings you life and peace and hope, then the best thing that you can do for someone else is to understand where they're coming from, to empathize with them, and to speak their language until you get to a place where they will open their ears and listen to what it is that you have to say. Because when you raise the volume and you speak at or down to somebody, they're never going to hear it. And the message you and I have is too good to hear for us to ruin it with the way in which we approach people. So in humility, I want to challenge you to take a chapter from Paul's book in how you approach the larger culture because you care about their lives and about their destinies. And if need be, maybe it's time for some repentance of our own to think differently about how we're living our lives so that our lives can be light and salt and help and hope to everyone that we see. I want you to think about that as we pray. Father, Paul teaches us brilliantly even in a season where we are suffering and have experienced trauma personally, how, can, how we can remain on point, listening and looking for opportunities to connect with people 
in ways that will be redemptive. We ask that you would use us in a very real way to be people who bring hope, to be people with good news, who seek to love people, to connect in compassionate ways, to make a real difference. As we move through this day, help us to do so with open eyes and open ears and open hearts in the best, most redemptive way possible. It's in Christ that we pray these things. Amen.